I invite you to open your Bibles uh, to Philippians chapter 1 uh, for our, our reading from God's Word today. We're going to be looking at verses 3 through 11. Uh, it's, it's on your bulletins. It should also be on the screen behind me. God speaks to us from his living word. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Like I said, I'm tired. I think sometimes when I'm, uh, when I'm tired, my preaching can get a bit, bit more yelly. Uh, so my apologies in advance. Thankfully, this, this passage doesn't warrant yelliness. Um, I, uh, back in 2014, I did a, a, a fellowship, like an academic fellowship for a semester following uh, after I graduated from college. And I lived in this house with 15 other uh, folks who were my age. We're all in like our early to mid, some in our late 20s. And it was... Uh, we all lived in a house together, studied books together. It was a lot of fun. And, we, just, and we, we became really good friends. And one of the things that we did to become really good friends is we, we, we did hot seat. We played hot seat, which is when someone would come up to, would sit in a, in a seat in front of every, all the other folks in our class. And they would, everyone else in the class could ask them any question for like, when it was like a 15, 15 minutes or 20 minutes or something, and you can ask them anything. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, it's, it, you know, in our 20s, ask, you know, asking, you know, have, have you had girlfriends, boyfriends before? Uh, why are you a part, you know, why, is you, why are you part of that theological tradition? Um, it, was, it was a really fun time. Uh, but I wanted to, I made a suggestion to that group with a game of hot seat where I said, hey, how about after our time of hot seat asking people questions, what if we did a, a few minutes of where people in the audience, since we have become good friends, where we encourage the person and we give that person compliments who's, who's up front, just uh, encourage them. And I was, I was vetoed. People were not interested in doing that at all. Uh, more than one person said, they were like, I would much prefer you to ask me any question than for you, every, these people here to look at me, look me in the eye and give me compliments. That would make me way more uncomfortable. And like, it, it's, why are we like this? I, I, it's, as, it's, it's really, it's like, there's some, there's some, I bet there's a lot of people in this room who are, and honestly, now that I'm 10 years past that, I actually really get it. Like, if, if I were to sit here and be like, all right, and everyone's going to now shout, say compliments at me, it'd be really uncomfortable. Or if I were to have you come up and do that, you'd probably be like, oh, fidgety. Um, I don't know what it is about us, why, why that, that gives us the heebie-jeebies so much. Is it, is it revealing that people don't really know us because they would compliment us in ways that we don't know or expect or ways we're ashamed? Um, is there something about being encouraged that still feels like being judged in a way, even if it's positive? I'm not sure. And maybe some of you would know more better than me. But I do know, I, I once heard a, a wise pastor say uh, that there's nobody in the church who is suffering because they have been encouraged too much. Nobody. Uh, it's a really rare thing to have someone in your life who will look you in the eyes and who, who will say, I really appreciate that thing about you. And I would say it's a special joy of something that I get to do as a pastor. Paul, the author of this passage, as we've been studying, now we're studying the, this, this, this short letter the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. Paul, in this letter, he is not afraid to put the Philippians in the encouragement hot seat in the passage that we just read. The tone of this passage is just overwhelming joy and exuberance as he remembers them and prays for them. And as we look at this, 
this, this short passage, this opening of this letter, I want to draw your attention to two things in these verses. Paul's encouragement and Paul's prayer. And in each of these things, we'll see Paul's heart. We'll, see, we'll learn about the Philippians' faithfulness. But most importantly, I think, as we look at these two things, we'll see Christ, that Christ is faithful to begin a good work in us, bear fruit in us along the way, and bring us to completion at the final day, all for God's glory. I think that's what we're going to see. And this is what we, like Paul, should pray for the lives of others. So let's start with Paul's encouragement. The first, th- the first three verses, verses 3 through 5, look um, at those with me again. Paul opens by saying, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. And as I read it again, can you hear the alls and the everys? He thanks God in all his remembrance of them. All the things he thinks about them, he's thankful. Always in every prayer of his, for you all, for the entire church in Philippi, not just for his favorite, team, his favorite folks at the church, his, his A squad, the good guys or something, for all of them. Imagine being in Philippi, hearing the reading of this letter as it's later you know, delivered and brought back, hearing this introduction. It would just, just hearing this introduction would be really encouraging. You think, hey, this guy, he thinks about us. He's really grateful for us. He hasn't forgotten about us. That's, that's some of the beginning of his encouragement. Why is Paul thankful for them, according to verse 5? What does verse 5 say? He's because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So this partnership in the gospel that Paul is thanking the Philippian church for, it's, it could just be referring to his camaraderie with them in mission, if you go back and read Acts 16, I mentioned this briefly in our sermon last week, you can see how the church of Philippi started. There were some adventures, to put it mildly. There were God provided and led in some big ways. And the Philippian church was, you know, they were there for that. They were with Paul. Uh, they had adventures together in ministry. But this partnership in the gospel, it's most likely a reference to the Philippians' history of giving generous financial gifts in support of Paul and his ministry endeavors. And the Philippian church, um, they had been generous before. If you read elsewhere in the New Testament, if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians 8, Paul is writing to a church that is wealthier than the Philippian church. And he has this kind of tortured passage where he's, trying, he's asking the Corinthian church to give. And the way that he motivates the Corinthian church to give, uh, to support his ministry, support uh, a collection that he's doing for the saints in Jerusalem, is he says, he points, he's like, hey, the Macedonian church, they gave, well, you know, they gave far beyond their means. And he, he points at the, this, this other church that had been really generous in giving to the collection for the saints in Jerusalem. The Macedonian church, that, that's, that's in reference almost surely to Philippi, uh, that this, this poorer church in a poorer area of Greece had given really generously. That's, that's, that's what the Philippians are known for. That's what Paul thinks about, their partnership in the gospel. They've been repeatedly hospitable and generous to, toward him. And the purpose of this letter, I talked about this a bit last week, but to name it again, is because they had, the, Paul, this, this letter is, is really like the, one of the most famous thank you letters ever written. This, the occasion of this letter is because the Philippians heard that Paul was imprisoned and they sent a man named Epaphroditus to, to go greet Paul and to give him uh, a financial gift. The purpose of this letter was, was, in th- it was is Paul thanking the Philippians for their gift to him. So Paul is saying, thank you for your generous partnership over the years and right now. And I'm so, he's, he's so encouraged as he remembers them. And it's, he's really encouraged, uh, particularly as we look at this passage, at the timing of this gift which they have sent. Uh, we can see this in verse 7. So in verse 7, Paul says, it's right for me to feel this way about you, which is he's saying, it's, it's right for me to be so thankful for you. It's right for me to, be, to trust that Christ is working in you because, he continues, because I hold you all in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. This is great. Um, I want to zero in on that last line. Both in, you are partakers with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. 
Uh, this line, this, this phrase, partakers with me of grace, is, is, is actually kind of a, a challenging clause to translate. And if you have a, like an ESV Bible, you'll see a footnote there suggesting an alternate translation. Uh, the, the, this like partakers word, it's, it's, a, it's the same word that we get for, like, for fellowship. It's, it's the Greek word koinonia. Um, it comes with, this is the word that we get the word communion from. He's saying, hey, you've all had, you've, you've all, you have all fellowshiped with me in grace. We've communed together. And it's, it's almost like he's saying, hey, you stuck with me in grace. You're partakers with me. And the timing of the Philippians gift is astounding because of what we see. He references, then he's like, both in my imprisonment, he references his imprisonment, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So the timing of the gift, it's astounding because the, so remember, they, the Philippians and other churches, they've been supporting Paul because they, he was doing gospel apostolic ministry. He was planting churches. He was strengthening churches. Uh, he was, you know, writing letters like this to encourage the churches. How productive do you think a guy would be in doing that work if he was chained to a wall in prison? Not very. Uh, and the Philippians... They, they hear that Paul's in prison, and even though he's, he's, at a t- he's in a place where he's going to be the least productive as an apostle, they still send him a really generous gift because they, they love him so much. And their partnership with Paul and the gospel runs so deep that they, they, don't need to, they don't need to give him a gift at a time where he's going to be the most productive in ministry. This would be like the equivalent of, uh, and this is like hot controversial thing in the NFL this year, and it, um, is paying running backs. Uh, this would be like an NFL team giving their star running back an extension, a generous extension, the year after the running back had torn his ACL. Like, it's, it's a statement. It, the Philippian church is in this gift is communicating to Paul, we believe in you, we believe in your future, we're with you, and we're willing to take a risk and like, empty our pocketbooks in order to give this to you. Are you beginning to see why Paul loves this church so much and why he's so eager to encourage them? Do you see why, as you hear in the background of that, do you see why Paul writes in verse 9, I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus? This is a church that's just stuck with Paul through thick and through thin. And of course, we'll see in the next session, we'll see next week that actually Paul's ministry while he's been in chains has actually been fruitful. He actually, there, there actually are people in prison who are coming to Christ because Paul is there. But the Philippian church, they didn't know that. And they sent him a really generous gift anyways. So there's, in this, there's more encouragement for the Philippians. Paul sees their generosity towards him at the least likely of times. And he, and he's, he encourages them. He's, and um, he names it. But the bedrock of Paul's encouragement to the Philippians, um, continue with our first point of of encouragement, is in verse 6. And it's that Christ is working in them. Paul says this, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. I talked a lot yesterday in a room without a microphone, and I think my voice is starting to give out. So if, 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 if I'm like making weird noises, I, I'm not choking up or crying, it's because my voice is starting to, to give out. Um, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He notes that the Philippians have been generous towards him, not just because they're nice people, not just because they're good folks, but because Christ, the one through whom the world was created, he's begun a good work in them. And that's why they're giving this gift. They're not just trying hard, but they're being used by God to bless. And not only that, looking at their kindness and looking at Christ, Paul tells them that the work that Christ began in them, that he's seeing now with this gift, it will be brought to completion at the end of all things, that Christ will continue growing this good thing he sees in them. And he will carry them through to the very end. That's really the bedrock of Paul's encouragement to the Philippians. And we're going to see it again and again in this letter. And this may sound like this, this like, 
a good work is, and is super encouraging because Christ began it, Christ is going to finish it. This may sound a bit clunky and theological. So let me try and paint a picture for you so you can see how Paul's encouragement works here, okay? I'm going to try to, in the, the way that Paul does here, I'm going to try and encourage a particular sector of our congregation. And there are other people, there are other groups that I could be encouraging in, in a similar sort of way. Stay-at-home moms. Stay-at-home moms in this congregation. And, this, and now they're all in the hot seat and they're, they're the ones uncomfortable. I want you to know that I, I see how you stay-at-home moms have struggled to be stuck between two worlds. You want to be a present mom for your kids and you're, while, while you're stuck, the other world's like you're saying no to your desire to have a job, maybe to help ends meet, make ends meet, or to, or to uh, just a desire to have a job. You're stuck between these two worlds. And, and you're, now you're in a place where you're being more valued, or you, you want to be, in a, maybe perhaps you want to be in a place where you're more valued for what you cook or clean or, or, what, or cleaning up diapers, or whatever it may be. I want to tell you, like, I've seen how you've borne the scorn of being treated by others as an unproductive member of society. I've seen that. Um, and by the way, working moms have the opposite uh, scorn that they have to bear, so... Uh, which is that they're bad moms because they work, by the way. But stay-at-home moms, I've seen you bear terrible double standards. I, as a dad, I can take my kids out on a walk and the chaos is really cute. Moms take their kids, stay-at-home moms who are working their their tails off to love their kids, they take the, the kids out and there's chaos and everyone criticizes them. I've seen you bear with these challenges yet still strive to discipline your kids, teach them about Jesus, take care of your home, invest in the church, and love your neighbors. I've seen you all do it. And what I've seen in you, it's really beautiful and inspiring to me. This thing that I've seen in you, this jewel, it's Christ who began this work in you. It's when you're doing these things and it's growing in you, it's the fruit of Christ. And more than that, Christ is going to take this good thing the ways that you're loving your kids on the hardest of days, this good thing, you being who God's called you to be, Christ's going to take this good thing and he's going to bring it to total completion. He's going to grow it into fullness. I'm confident of that. Do you hear the encouragement in that? Do you hear how anchoring this encouragement in Christ, it's more than just like, hey, high five, I see you're trying hard. But it's, it's, it's anchoring the good works that people do in the, the grand scheme of things. That the labors of, of someone are anchored in Christ. Christ began it. He will complete it. Way more encouraging than, hey, you did a nice thing. Um, and this is, this is encouragement. It's, it's honest and personal and rooted in Christ. It's both. Sometimes we think like, hey, a Christian encouragement just kind of needs to be like a cardboard encouragement. Paul's here is, is not that at all. It's not a Jesus juke. It's not phony encouragement. It's deep and rooted in Christ. Let's move on to talking about Paul's prayer. Uh, in verse 9, uh, Paul shifts uh, to pray for the Philippians. He names that he's praying. Uh, I, as I read this passage, he names that he's praying in, verses, in, verse, th- in for, for verse 4. He says, I pray for you all the time. I think verses 9 and following are the prayer that he prays for the Philippians nonstop. Um, let's look at this prayer in detail. I think it's really rich and really packed. He begins by saying, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Uh, This is Paul, this is the thing that Paul is praying for the Philippians. This is what they need, is that they would love one another and that they would grow in knowledge. For Paul, these two things, love and knowledge, the life of the heart and the life of the mind, are intertwined. He does not pray for a pure, that they would just be pure and flawless in their doctrine, that they would know all the right things, yet produce no love. He doesn't pray that they would just be carefree, flippant with their love, loving anyone no matter what or in, under any circumstances. But he says, no, like, he, he prays for a knowledge that's anchored and connected to the, to the truth. For Paul, the head and the heart, the mind, and, and, and heart, are, his mind and love are inseparable. 
And um, why is Paul praying for these things, for love and knowledge, for the Philippians? It's because they lack them in some ways. That's kind of behind the scenes here. Uh, they, we'll see this in the chapters ahead. This is a church that is in, there are at least cracks of conflict and disunity in the church. So Paul praying for these things is actually, it's areas of their weakness where they need to grow. And we'll see this in chapter two where Paul will bring again these two things of love and knowledge um, in like his particular exhortations to the Philippians. He'll say, hey, look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. What does that sound like? It sounds like love each other and have this mind among yourselves. What does that sound like? Knowledge. Know, know, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Know what Christ has done for you. These things are tied together, love and knowledge. He prays that the Philippians will love one another more as they grow in knowledge of Christ. These things are interrelated. He continues, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Why does Paul pray that the Philippians would grow in love and knowledge? Because they lack it, I said. The ultimate purpose of him praying this, why he longs for this, for the Philippians, is so that they will mature in what they approve of in accord with all godliness. So that as the day of Christ draws closer, the Philippians will be pure and blameless, which evidently that means they aren't pure and blameless, by the way. He prays this so that as the day of Christ draws closer, they will exhibit more and more fruit of being in Christ. In summary, the purpose of Paul's prayer here we see in this verse is the Philippians' sanctification. Sanctification's a $5 theological word. Uh, What it basically means is growing in right living before God and before others. Growing in loving God and loving your neighbor. This is Paul's hope for them. This is why he's praying for them is so that they will be more sanctified. And a, a sidebar here on like Paul's desire why he's praying this specific thing for them for their sanctification. A sidebar on this, I wouldn't know that like the, Paul's friendship here with the Philippians, his prayer for this, this is the distinction between Christian friendship and friendship that the world offers. Christian friendship, like Paul's with the Philippians, it has a goal in mind, and it's sanctification for the friend the friend becoming more pure and blameless in preparation for the day of Christ. That's why we're in this together. And if I heard, I'll I'll put put myself in your guys' seats. If I would have heard that this this point, what I just said right now in a sermon like 10 years ago, I would have rolled my eyes at hearing that. Like, doesn't it just feel like viewing friendship this way turns it into some weird spiritual leveling up game? Doesn't this feel fake? like Ned Flanders from The Simpsons or something, wanting, like, your friends so that the other person can be sanctified, grow in holiness. Uh, Like, friendship, as we, as as the world offers, uh, it can just feel so much more enjoyable and relaxed, right? Like, can't we just spend time together? What's the big deal? Uh, My counter to myself from 10 years ago, uh, it would be an image. Uh, Who are you better friends with? Who would you be better friends with? A person that you sit next that you sit next to as you watch a movie. Just like the means of our the the bedrock of our relationship is that we consume things together. We enjoy consumption together. Are you better friends with a fellow moviegoer, or a person you're going to war with? Someone with whom you share a mutual mission, and you're watching each other's backs. And you, you know, and you making a mistake could have disastrous consequences and vice versa. A fellow moviegoer or a brother in arms in a foxhole. Which one is a deeper, more profound friendship? Christian friendship, of course, is more like the foxhole friendship. And of course, a, of course they're just enjoying one another and then spending time together. You can hear that in, Paul, in Paul's love for the Philippians, right? I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. It has all of that great stuff in it. But Christian friendship is, it's, it's actually deeper because there's mission, there are stakes. It's important. 
seeking sanctification. In Christian friendship, hey, it only makes sense if God is real, if Jesus rose from the dead, and one day he'll come back to judge the living and the dead. If that's the case, then it makes sense for our friendship to be about sanctification. Um, and besides, like I said, no one could accuse Paul of not just enjoying the Philippians. He writes later I, that he just wants to come and be with them. It has all of, the, all, all of just the joy of being together in it, but there's also a yearning for the other party to grow in holiness. He concludes the prayer by, by, with just a line. He says, to the glory and praise of God. Paul prays for the Philippians that they would grow in love and knowledge. Why does he pray that? So that they would be sanctified, so they grow in righteousness. But here's the ultimate why underneath Paul's prayer. The ultimate purpose why Paul prays for the Philippians is to the glory and praise of God. The bedrock, the ultimate purpose of all things going on with the Philippians and the ways that they need to grow, the ultimate purpose, the thing that Paul longs for is the glory of God and praise of God. It's the bedrock of the prayer. So as we've been working through this prayer, have you heard the richness of who Christ is in this prayer? Oh, geez, Louise. iPad. Can't wait for our printer to work again. Um, do you hear the richness of who, who Christ is in this prayer? Christ is the one who will one day come, come to judge. The day of Christ is referenced a lot in this prayer. But he's also, Christ is also the one through whom the fruit of righteousness comes along the way. Can you see how Paul's theology of Christ is just, it's, it's really here in this, this whole passage. Christ is the beginning of all growth in the Christian life. He says, he, he references Christ as the one who began a good work in you. Christ also is the means of all growth along the way. He says, he prays that you be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes, how? Through Christ. And Christ is the one who will bring our growth to completion at the end. When he says Christ will bring a good work to completion in you. Christ is the beginning, the middle, and the end of our lives, of our hope of becoming who God created us to be, to be pure and without blemish. And yet Paul can have this theology of Christ while at the same time issuing commands that require free obedience on behalf of the Philippians. He commends them for being generous. He prays that they would grow in loving one another and knowledge. Clearly, this is a theology of Christ that's not an excuse for passivity, but a motivation for activity, for them growing. And I'll conclude here, just as to note in these last few verses, this is a way that you can pray for people. Um, praying for people is really hard. Uh, and I say that it's, it's kind of my job to do that to pray for people, and I would tell you, it's, it's a challenging thing for me to do. It's not natural. Uh, and I would guess most of us here, you at least think prayer, hey, hey, prayer's a good thing. I should pray for people. I want to pray for people. But if you've tried, you know what I'm saying, that, it, and that it's hard to, to, to pray for people. It's hard to know, what, what am I supposed to pray for people for? I'm, I know sometimes to provide, to, like, I ask that God would give them the things that they say they need, that they're saying they need, that they would be healing in certain ways. Maybe I just get, you can pray for blessing for people. When I pray for people, I, I tend to get stuck in ruts, kind of just praying the same thing for them over and over again. Or maybe you, you, don't, you, you want to pray for people more, but you don't know how. And you're not sure what you're supposed to pray for. If that's you, I would commend Paul's prayer here in verses 9 through 11 as just a model for how to pray for people in your lives, for anyone in your life. Think about what he, he, he bases it in like asking you, ask God for ways uh, that he would provide ways for the person to grow in ways that they're weak, in ways that they need healing. That's how Paul opens also pray for people that they would grow in righteousness, that they would be sanctified. That's an appropriate thing to pray for anybody all the time. Paul prays it all the time, he says. And finally, ask God that in this person's life that God would receive glory and praise. 
it's a really basic example of just how to pray for anyone in your life. I would commend it to you for that. We could do far worse in terms of ways that we pray for people. So I'll pray that this prayer for, for, for our church to close. Liberty, I pray that your love would abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, all to the glory and praise of God. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.